<laughs> okay. Well, let me uh, step out here a little bit. So um, you've all heard, heard this, so there's really not uh, much to really add. Um, it, it is a disease that affects 1% of the population, and obviously gluten does damage. And I think the theme here um, is that a gluten-free diet is the only available treatment, and it is uh, relatively ineffective for a number of, of, of um, uh, diseased individuals. And so uh, you've all seen what a healthy uh, small intestine looks like in cross-section uh, with very um, pronounced uh, villi, and the measurement that's often used for uh, understanding histologic health is the villus height crypt depth. And in a very uh, damaged situation, there's very serious villus atrophy and swelling of the intestinal wall. So these are the extreme cases that you can see, and for most patients, will will lie between those two extremes. Um, <clears throat> all of this you've known, so I'm just going to kind of race through it. They're the acute effects that you get that last for a day or two. You get glutened, and if this is not controlled in a in a in a nice manner, it can lead to long-term health issues and. A number of them that you're aware of are listed over here. So it's a serious disease, and uh, it really requires a gluten-free diet, but it needs something as an adjunct to a gluten-free diet. Um, just a, uh, a look at things. Um, the fallacy of a gluten-free diet, you can never be fully gluten-free. Things sneak in, and uh, this is kind of a, a, a test here. Uh, which of the following is gluten-free? Um, well. It's, uh, you know, a lot of those are not. <laughs> well, I see, I see people pointing at the gluten-free box there, but that's not necessarily all gluten-free because that is mandated to have a level not higher than 20 ppm by uh, an ELISA test. And so uh, some, that's a fairly low level, so that's fairly safe, and it's good to have these foods. But for very, very sensitive people, 20 ppm can actually uh, trigger, trigger effects. And the other thing that's less recognized, and Jennifer alluded it to also, is that the ELISA test, um, it's not a rock solid, accurate test. It's, uh, there's a variability in the responsivity to different types of gluten, so if it registers at 20 ppm, it may not actually be 20 ppm, it could be higher. So there's just all of that, so you have to be careful. So the true gluten-free, product here is Tito's Vodka. <laughs> so if you're feeling like a martini later, you can drink it safely. All right, so a few, uh, a few facts here. So how are you feeling? So we, we conducted, or we didn't, our predecessors, Alvine, conducted a very large phase 2B clinical trial, 500 patients. And some of the data, and this is data from there and also from other um, trials that have been published. And I need to actually get a laser. Uh, laser. I need, I need three hands, actually. <laughs> so in symptoms, I think you've, we've heard a lot of this. Uh, for many, many uh, patients uh, have very negligible, if, if, if uh, no symptoms, about 15%, mild 32%, but about half of uh, celiac disease patients on a gluten-free diet still report moderate to severe symptoms. On histology, uh, you, saw the, you saw the plots of villus height crypt depth um, for uh, villus height crypt depth greater than 2, which is not necessarily totally healthy on the fringe of being healthy. Obviously, 3 is healthy. About 82% fall in that category. However, about 1 in 5 fall in this category of less than 2, which is a very serious damage uh, of the intestine, of the small intestine. And for those who are symptomatic, about 30% actually have um, histologic damage of a serious nature. Um, looking at the serology, so about 80% of patients after um, adhering to a gluten-free diet for a year are seronegative, at least for uh, uh, NETG2 IgA. But 20% persist as seropositive, and so they're having difficulty uh, recovering. And if you're symptomatic, that number is 23%. And if you are symptomatic with uh, a damaged uh, mucosa, it's 43%. And so these are some of the statistics. And, and to sum it up, about 50% of celiac disease patients have good control of their diets and health. Uh, about 50%, though, do suffer from moderate to severe symptoms, and about 20% have serious intestinal damage.
good. So how many are there? Well, we know that uh, about 1% of the world's population has celiac disease, but the diagnosis rates are much less than that. And it's very hard to derive these diagnosis rates, uh, mostly because of the way the databases are formulated and the way that these meta-analyses are conducted. Uh, sometimes have biases, but we've, from, from what we have been able to pull together, and we've seen the 17% figure before, about five years ago, the diagnosis rate was basically one in six, about 17%. But there's a lot of uh, new evidence here that the diagnosis rates are improving, and uh, we've come up with something around 30%. And so that's a significant improvement and is also hallmarking the fact that there's greater awareness and individuals are being uh, diagnosed with better diagnostics and so forth. And it's not a diagnosis of last resort, it's actually something that is um, rationally reached in a shorter period of time. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about our solution. So this is a non-dietary therapeutic drug and it's based on a combination of um, digestive enzymes. And so this is called latagglutinase, and it consists of two recombinant gluten-specific enzymes. And the way it works, it works in your stomach. You take this orally with a meal, and it will break down gluten in your stomach. So if you are uh, um, ingesting gluten inadvertently, which happens all the time, you're protected. And this works by breaking along um, glutamine bonds and proline bonds in a way that the, uh, reduces the gluten proteins and larger peptides down to small enough sizes that they're no longer immunogenic. Now, this is what it looks like. It's just a powder. You add it to a glass. You add water. You stir. And you drink it with your meal. And it's flavored. And it's actually quite tasty and refreshing. <laughs> so if you're, not a, if you're not a celiac disease patient, you might want to drink this anyways. So it's a non-systemic, it's not absorbed in the body, so it works in the stomach, and it's eliminated through the, uh, through the um, uh, intestinal tract, and so it's very safe. And uh, it's also orally administered, obviously. A lot of these biologic drugs are, are injected, either subcutaneously or intradermal or IV. So it's a very safe and very convenient therapy. All right, so I want to show you some results from a previous clinical trial. So this was a phase 2B trial. This was conducted on 500 patients. And uh, what was observed is that there was significant improvement in symptom relief, but it was actually focused or totally concentrated in the seropositive patients. And in this trial, which recruited moderately to severe patients, about 40% of them were seropositive. So this is a sizable fraction of the total um, trial population. And you can see for four different symptoms, and this was also measured with an outcome tool much like what Wendy had talked about, which is, uh, in this case, a celiac disease uh, uh, symptom diary, the CDSD um, patient reported outcome tool. Um, and these showed that for four, four symptoms, there was quite significant reduction, and I'm trying to find my lighter here, <laughs> quite significant reduction relative to placebo uh, in the severity and frequency for abdominal pain, bloating, tiredness, and constipation. And those reductions relative to placebo range from 33 to 56%. So these are quite su su substantial reductions, uh, all with p-values significantly below 0 0.05, which is the standard for uh, statistical robustness. And so these are showing statistically and clinically significant multi-symptom relief um, for these seropositive patients. Uh, additional data, so this trial looked at uh, six doses, actually, well, five including, well, six doses, as I'm looking at it, and it showed a very clear dose dependence, which is a very important thing to show for an active and uh, efficacious drug. So for abdominal pain, I keep losing my light, I think it's dead. Oh, there it is, okay, <laughs> it's just trying to hide from me, I can't hide for long. So for abdominal pain and bloating, you can see a very clear linearly increasing trend for percent uh, improvement in these symptoms with dose. So we haven't yet hit our optimal dose, and this is a safe drug, so we can go higher. And uh, also we find, I love this plot here, because this is showing for individual patients for the 900 milligram dose, these are the individual reductions in symptom uh, as a function of their baseline score. And this is showing that the more severe you are, 
the better the result. So this drug is working best for those who are most in need. And for some of these patients here who have very high baseline scores are almost completely being relieved of their symptoms. And that's for abdominal pain and for bloating. So this is a very active drug, very uh, uh, efficacious for symptom reduction. And then I uh, thought it would be interesting to look at this on a daily basis. So this tool, uh, much like what Wendy talked about, records symptom levels on a daily basis. And here is a, a patient who was on the 900 milligram dose. Now you start out, this is uh, to the left of this vertical line is the run-in period, the baseline period before you start taking the drug or the placebo. And you can see that symptoms are not necessarily this ongoing average. Um, it, is, it, is, it consists with uh, of flares, and, and, and it's not too hard to imagine why. You get glutened, you get flared, and that's what you're seeing here in this particular case where we show abdominal pain, bloating, and tiredness. Abdominal pain is flaring up. As Soon as the treatment period starts, all of a sudden this patient recovers, gets much better. And so that is, it's a very fast response too. Now, in the case of the placebo, you can see a lot of this flaring and so forth, but this particular patient doesn't recover because they're on placebo. So uh, this, um, these results have been, were not immediately recognized when the trial was originally uh, conducted because it wasn't a primary endpoint. And so upon uh, further analysis, it became very clear that there was a huge benefit uh, to several positive patients uh, for symptom relief. And that's now been recognized with a number of publications. Uh, most recently, we received a grant from the uh, National Institute of Health to conduct a trial, not only for the latigluteinase, but for a diagnostic that we also are developing. And it's been getting a lot of recognition in various news outlets. So I want to close with uh, another part of what it takes to get a drug to market is whether the insurers are going to pay for it. And, uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, we've conducted payer research and there's also comparables and so forth that substantiate that this drug will come to market and the insurers will support it. But most importantly is the fact that there is an economic benefit to it. So this is a, a study that was conducted um, by Stefano Guandolini and his coworkers, which shows the cost of care for patients who have celiac disease, all, and those who are in partial remission, so they're the more severe. And that's against a control group. And there's a substantial cost of care for celiac disease patients. Um, can be over $10,000 for those who are most severe. So if a treatment is, comes along to relieve that and reduce the cost of care, then, then it's a very economically beneficial um, outcome. In addition to the, re, you know, to the quality of life and the health benefits that, that the celiac disease patients would also uh, receive from this. So I'd like to then uh, conclude with a few key points here. One is uh, celiac disease patients often consume unsafe amounts of gluten. We already heard the study that showed it's not uncommon to consume hundreds of milligrams uh, inadvertently when maybe less than 50 would be considered a safe level. So obviously uh, there needs to be non-dietary therapeutic solutions and there are several in development and you've heard about them and you'll hear about one more I believe. And uh, Latagglutinase is a promising candidate in late-stage phase two clinical trials. It's demonstrated histologic protection and symptomatic reduction. In clinical trials, it has an excellent safety profile. It's orally administered, and uh, it's a fast-track drug supported by the FDA. So I thank you for your attention.